right, I think that's time. Um, very impressive crowd for 5.30, uh, considering there is amazing beer outside. Uh, so I'll move fast. I have over 90 slides, 30 minutes, which gives me roughly 20 seconds per, for each slide. Um, I work at Google, but not on Android or Kotlin. I work uh, on Google Home, uh, Java Champion, XGD, and I happen to uh, wrote a book on uh, design patterns. It was a Java ebook, but looks like I can't stop uh, <laughs> using design patterns on any language I'm doing. Uh, I'm working on. So this was a talk which I did with Reza Rahman at Java One. Um, again on design patterns with Java E. So first, uh, this is not an official Google talk, uh, so if you're looking for something like that, you can leave the room, join another session. As I mentioned, I work in the Google Home team, so uh, neither Kotlin nor Android is my daily job. Uh, this is all my personal stuff. So why this talk? Uh, simply because design patterns makes you look cool, smart, geeky. Uh, if you have an ongoing technical discussion with a coworker, you can easily won the discussion if you just throw up some patterns. If you have some design patterns in your bookshelf, they look amazing. You can just uh, tweet or Instagram some photos and all your friends will just think you're amazing. Uh, <laughs> But uh, to be honest, it just makes your life easier when you're building software. So this is really funny. Uh, that, uh, according to Dijkstra, object-oriented programming is a terribly bad idea. And actually, uh, if we just roll back and think about it, uh, design patterns uh, came up after uh, C++ was ruling the software world. So a uh, gang of four um, explains design patterns, who are the uh, first people who wrote the book and uh, kind of found the design patterns idea. Uh, design patterns are descriptions of communicating objects and classes that are customized to solve a general design problem in a particular context. And this is from my book. I can't just say it's what I, something I said. Uh, it's basically uh, because the collective wisdom thing is something which everyone says. So basically, design patterns are collective, wis collective wisdom of many smart developers before you who had pain and come up with an idea of solving an existing problem, which occurs most of the time. So, Kotlin, what's Kotlin? Uh, Kotlin is a, a statically typed language which runs on JVM. Uh, it can be compiled to JavaScript or decompiled to Java, which I'll show uh, in the uh, slides. It's interoperable with uh, Java code, um, works with the existing Java class libraries, and um, uh, also adds its own stuff like uh, mutable, non-mutable collections. Uh, it's designed and developed by JetBrains, and it, according to Wikipedia, it's named after an island like Java. But actually, Java is after, uh, uh, after named after the coffee. Well, uh, espresso and other stuff was taken, so <laughs> probably that's good enough. So uh, some tools. First, uh, Java to Kotlin, if you are using IntelliJ, and since we are targeting Kotlin, probably you should. Uh, you can just click code and uh, select convert Java file to Kotlin, and IntelliJ will do the work for you. Instead, you can just create a new Kotlin file and copy-paste your Java code there, and again, IntelliJ will ask you if you want to convert the code, and uh, does the job for you. And something more interesting is, if you want to switch back to uh, Java from Kotlin, you can go to, go, uh, to Tools, select Kotlin, and uh, show uh, Kotlin bytecode, which will bring up the 
bytecode, which has the decompile option, and when you uh, click decompile, uh, it will give you the Java code. So most of the slides are uh, prepared using those tools. So in the slides, if you see these symbols, it means it's either written in Java or Kotlin or converted from one to other. So let's move. Gang of four design patterns with Kotlin. First, creational patterns. Singleton. Uh, so Singleton basically tries to uh, ensure a class has only one instance and provide a global point uh, of uh, access to uh, that instance. The classic implementation is like uh, making the constructor private, uh, double locking st static initializers or enums. Um, of course, it must be thread safe, ideally reflection safe, and uh, a lot of frameworks, platforms uh, such as Java E, Spring, Android uses singletons. So if we just uh, look at a naive Java example, uh, we have the static variable which creates the singleton, so it's not lazy loading, and there's a, a, a static method which uh, basically uh, lets anyone to access the singleton. And as you can see, the uh, constructor is, of course, private. So if we convert this to Kotlin, we see something interesting. There's something called object. Uh, basically, Kotlin doesn't have the static uh, uh, symbol, so uh, we have something different. And uh, basically, this will replace uh, the whole singleton class with uh, this much of code. If we do something nicer with Java and follow uh, best practices and, of course, Joshua block and create an enum singleton and see how it's converted to Kotlin, we see actually uh, it doesn't try to change it a lot and creates a, a sing, uh, enum in Kotlin. And it's basically much or less what you would expect when uh, you switch between Java to Kotlin. If you try to write something native in Kotlin with, by just uh, leaving your Java knowledge aside, um, what you need to use is the object and uh, create a singleton with the object uh, syntax. What is interesting is if you decompile this to Java, yeah, and uh, object makes the singleton without any additional effort. If you decompile this into Java, uh, you'll see actually uh, Kotlin is doing a lot of stuff in the background and it's basically lazy loaded, loaded and reflection and um, uh, I forgot the word, never mind. Uh, reflection and um, quite safe singleton. So, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, this is not about Kotlin, basically about singletons. Uh, singletons are ex uh, good for expensive object, caching, global access, but overuse can cause problems, especially if they're not lazy loaded. And uh, if they're lazy loaded, then they can cause delays. And the ugly part is sometimes they are considered as an enter pattern. Next, factory method. Uh, factory method is basically uh, defines an interface for creating uh, objects. And uh, the idea is encapsulate the object creation into one place. So if you need changes in the future, you don't need to uh, change a lot of different places in the code. So let's see a factory method example in Java. We have a car interface and two different brands which implements the car. And we have a factory which creates the car we want as uh, passed with the parameter. Nothing interesting so far. Let's switch to Kotlin. And that was actually the only example which gave a compiler when I did the conversion which I'll explain why. But basically we have uh, the same interface and concrete classes, except 
for uh, the parentheses and less lines of code. Kotlin is pretty good with that. Almost every slide you'll see uh, less lines. And we have our factory, which does almost the same thing. But in this case, uh, Kotlin cannot return null because in Kotlin, null is, a, is a treated differently than Java. So what we need to do is to place an Elvis operator. So now um, return type of null is a valid return for our method. And if I try to write a factory method native in Kotlin, I couldn't come up with anything better than which Kotlin created from Java, except for the Elvis operator, uh, which I typed initially. Again, the good, the bad, ugly. Uh, these uh, factory methods are very easy uh, to implement. They are very efficient in encapsulating the object creation. The bad part is, although it might be enough most of the time, uh, you may uh, prefer to move to abstract factory because if things get a little bit complicated, you would need that. And the ugly part is, uh, it may create complicated messy code if you don't need it and just put it to show off. <laughs> so, abstract factory. Uh, again, it's a, a pattern to encapsulate object creation and uh, provide an interface for uh, creating objects. Uh, it's a creational pattern, very similar to factory method. And uh, the thing different in abstract factory is each subclass has its own factory. Uh, by the way, it's commonly used in many SDKs and especially in JDK. Um, continue from the Previous example, we again have the same interface and same brands. Uh, this time, each brand has its own factory. And again, we have one factory which returns, uh, which uh, uses the right factory and returns the right brand we want to uh, create. When we uh, convert this into Kotlin, again, we don't see something special until we come to abstract factory. Here you can see a companion object uh, and it basically has the uh, function method. Again, uh, why we have this? Uh, because we don't have the static notion in uh, Kotlin. So Kotlin creates the companion object which acts like a static method uh, in this case. If we want to write this in Kotlin, again, without uh, using the Java knowledge, um, we see something different here. Uh, there's an inline function with reified generic some stuff. And I don't really have a lot of time to dig into this, but basically this is um, used for um, accessing the superclass of the objects. So, uh, without any casting, uh, Kotlin can decide uh, if Audi or Mercedes, uh, if the uh, method passed is Audi or Mercedes without doing any um, um, object um, reflection. So if we uh, decompile this to Java, uh, this time we see something more complicated and uh, a lot of lines. Uh, the interesting part here is uh, the bold part, which uh, uses the reflection get or create Kotlin class. Uh, basically, this is the part which the uh, refight part kicks in. Um, again, abstract factories encapsulates objects uh, in favor of organization and um, as a uh, create the objects in a safe way. Uh, the bad part is, especially compared to factory method, it introduces more classes and overuse will introduce many classes in your project. So again, if, uh, use it only if you need to. Builder. Um, builder is a very effective pattern if you need to uh, create uh, 
more than one con constructors. Uh, it's basically very efficient in uh, construction of complex objects. Uh, by the way, each um, first slide, uh, the first item is from Gang of Four. Uh, so they are the, that's the definition of uh, the pattern in uh, Gang of Four terms. Uh, unlike factor method and abstract factory, uh, Builder doesn't really target polymorphism. Uh, basically, it tries to minimize the constructor overload. Um, uses another object to build the tar target object in the, uh, in the needed steps. And uh, basically creates the object uh, we need with the parameters we need. Uh, I'm using a very simple example here. Uh, usually, you wouldn't be needing a builder for just two property. But let's say, for the sake of a simpler code, which will uh, fit in the slide, we have a person object, which has name, surname. And uh, if we try to create every different uh, variation of uh, constructors, we'll end, still end up with one empty, one name, one surname, and name, surname constructors. Instead, we can just create a builder class, which will set the name, surname, or nothing. And in, uh, in the end, uh, when we call the build, it will create the uh, person object. So this is basically uh, the basic builder pattern. And we, if we just convert this to Kotlin, again, we'll see less code. Uh, first, the person class gets uh, simplified. And as you can see, both uh, properties are null, uh, can be null, so uh, it doesn't. Uh, it, they are not really required. And Kotlin basically creates an internal builder class which uh, sets the name or surname. But what if we want to write it in native Kotlin? Things get super easy because Kotlin has the uh, optionals. So basically, uh, with the optionals, we can just uh, give default values, and uh, we don't need to really use complicated builders. So in this case, if uh, we don't pass any argument to surname, it will be null. And if we decompile this cut one line Kotlin uh, into Java, we end up with a uh, longer Java class. And uh, if you check the methods, you can see it. actually there are more than one constructors. And basically, Kotlin is doing the uh, dirty work here and creating all the needed stuff. Um, again, the good, the bad, the ugly. Thanks to optionals, builder pattern is not really needed in uh, Kotlin. Um, optionals are nice, much easier to code, but may not be as self-explanatory as builder pattern. Uh, someone who has been using builder pattern for a while, or uh, even not for a while, can easily understand what's going on with the code, but optionals might not be that clear if you not, don't know the parameter list and uh, what you need to set. And the ugly part is, if you need to do really um, um, complicated stuff, you may need the builder, uh, especially if you uh, need some libraries work. Let's move to structural patterns. Oh, I'm short on time. So, facade, uh, basically it hides the complexity. Uh, uh, facade pattern is used in APIs. Uh, here's an example which does a bunch of method calls and uh, it's very prompt exception thanks to that stupid line I put there, uh, uh, which will probably uh, throw an exception uh, a lot, so don't do this at home, it's just for the slides. And if we convert this to Kotlin, uh, there's nothing special. Uh, basically, Kotlin is trying to uh, just convert everything, and writing it in Kotlin doesn't change a lot. It's just the font size, but still shorter. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, skip facades. They're just uh, good for 
uh, hiding the internal complexity and um, making it easy to change in the future without breaking the clients. Decorator. So decorator is super, super nice. Uh, they add behavior at uh, runtime to objects. Uh, much more flexible and extensible than in inheritance and allows functionality to be divided between classes with unique areas. So we have a pizza interface, a base pizza, which implements that interface, meat topping, veggie topping. So how we use it, uh, we create a base pizza, then toppings, and each topping at the um, constructor receives the previous item. So basically it's wrapping objects over each other and are creating the final object. If we convert this to Kotlin, it's again uh, much less lines. So basically Kotlin does the same thing, but we don't need the additional code and uh, writing this in native Kotlin doesn't really uh, have anything more to add. So uh, here uh, we can see the uh, Java to Kotlin tool uh, does mo uh, almost all the work. So the good part is unlike inheritance uh, with decorators, decorators, it's very easy to change the behavior without breaking the legacy code. And you can't really make me say anything negative with the decorators. <laughs> uh, that's my favorite pattern. Adapters. So adapters are a great pattern to use the uh, legacy code and uh, work the new uh, stuff uh, with the legacy client. Uh, it's based on delegation and wrapping. Uh, so here we have a very uh, good example uh, for travelers. So we have a U plug and US plug, which has different voltages and different uh, uh, implementations. So we create a voltage adapter uh, which implements U-plug, which can get a parameter of US-plug and convert it to EU-plug. This is a typical example of an adapter. If we convert this to Kotlin, again, it's not really a lot of change. Uh, it's a bit simplified, uh, but uh, mostly much or less the same amount of code. And Again, writing this in native Kotlin, uh, not really something that special to really uh, change a lot. So again, uh, another pattern which we just convert and uh, move forward. And the bad part with um, um, adapters is uh, if you use it, you will keep the legacy code forever. Behavioral patterns. Uh, let's start with strategy. So, uh, strategy is uh, good for uh, injecting the right behavior for the right job. It's easy to change and add new behaviors and works great with dependency injection. So, this is a typical strategy pattern example. We have an interface and two different implementations which uh, share the same interface and a class which doesn't even know which uh, one uh, it needs to use will be injected the right resource and uh, the uh, behavior uh, will uh, dynamically executed. If we convert this to Kotlin, again, it's a little, a little less lines, but much or less the same. And again, Kotlin, I didn't really find anything to make it uh, much more native Kotlin. Again, strategy is uh, very easy to implement and uh, very good for adding new behaviors, but once you set the contract, it's over and you can never change it. Let's skip comments since it's very similar to strategy. And observer. Um, Observer is uh, used in many frameworks and uh, it's also inside Java and Java E as an out of box solution. Um, if you look at the classic observer, observable uh, Java example, we have a radio channel, a publisher interface, and the new agency. 
where the new agency uh, uh, can have new observers and will notify each observer when a news item is added. So if we convert this to Kotlin, again, less signs, and what we see is if you want to write it in native Kotlin, uh, there is something new called delegates observable, uh, which returns a property delegate for a read write property that calls a specified callback function when uh, things change. So again, I don't have much time to dig into this, but if you go to the link, uh, you can read more about it. And uh, it's definitely less lines of code and much more native Kotlin looking uh, style code. And if you decompile this, you can see actually Kotlin is doing a lot. And the bold line here, uh, you can see there's a Java class called read write property, which Kotlin is internally using to execute and make things work. And um, you can, of course, uh, might be using Rx Java for observ observer. And if you convert a basic observer example to Kotlin, it's again much or less the same uh, what you would expect. Uh, not much difference. Uh, the only main difference is using the emitter, I guess. And decompiling it, again, uh, nothing surprising. Uh, there is a, a parameter check, and I think that's all. I'll skip to this and um, talk about dependency injection, which is Again, a very widely used uh, pattern, but surprisingly not a gang of four pattern. So it's also called inversion of control. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, go back and you'll see there's a huge discussion of if it should be called inversion of control or dependency injection. Uh, it's very, uh, uh, it, it helps you greatly in changing the implementation or even behavior, uh, such as injecting a mock object during testing, works greatly with strategy. Uh, basically, it really helps to build real uh, strategy patterns. It's available in many frameworks, CDI, if there are any Java E folks around, Spring Juice, Play, uh, Glassfish, Dagger, and actually, I will also give a Dagger example. So a naive Java example is much or less like the strategy pattern. And the real thing is who injects this code to this point. So the injection mechanism is actually the uh, dependency injection pattern. So if we convert the same code, uh, we'll see the same stuff from the strategy pattern. Uh, so let's see something more exciting. Let's try Dagger with Kotlin. So Dagger, if you're not familiar with it, it's a, a dependency injection framework based on uh, JSR 3.3.0. Um, it doesn't use any uh, reflection, so it's uh, considerably fast, but it's a little complicated if you're not familiar with it. So Dagger 101, uh, Dagger has three uh, things you need to know. The first one is module and provides, which is the mechanism uh, for providing the dependencies. Next, inject, uh, which is the mechanism for requesting dependencies. And finally, component, which is the bridge between modules and injections. So this is the sample from Dagger's website. Uh, so if you're interested in, in that, uh, you can go to the website and uh, follow from where I left. So we have the coffee maker, uh, which gets injected the heater and pump. And uh, here modules acts as a factory and component bridge, bridge them. If we convert this to Dagger, um, it's a little bit cleaner code, but again, it's not a huge change. Um, but basically the interesting thing is everything works out of box with just a simple um, conversion. So to wrap it up, um, dependency injection is super nice, but it kind of 
it's a magical ex uh, execution flow if you are new to it, so it might be hard to debug. So, to summarize, uh, with Kotlin, mostly it's a bit easier to um, implement the, method, uh, the patterns, and usually it's really less lines of code. And the Java to Kotlin tool is really working amazingly, and the other way, compiling Kotlin to Java can teach you really a lot. Uh, to be honest, uh, most of the Kotlin I learned was uh, during switching uh, uh, back and forth from Java to Kotlin. And with that, uh, I can answer some questions maybe offline. And if you like the talk, go out. If you don't like, don't, you don't need to out. Just uh, forget about it. And there are some nice links. Uh, one is a Kotlin book. The second is a talk from Jake Wharton. And third one is my book, uh, which is Java-y, but covers all patterns in simple Java. So thank you. <laughs>